Welcome to CC Family. We pray today's service inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read to you the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Put forth the picture with a title again. So I like that because as a surgeon, and that's a femur bone, and that's the hip joint right there, that's the kneecap right there, that's the, look, uh, it, it, it's, it's all, it, every mark, every claim, every detail of that bone, it has a story to tell, it has a purpose, and it has a function, amen? So, the hand of the Lord was, was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley, full of bones. We have already explored the scenario. This was the scene of total despair, but the Spirit of the Lord had brought the prophet to that place of desolation for a purpose. Amen. God asked Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel could have answered according to his limitations and total inadequacy. But the prophet knew that God was not trying to ask a trick question. He realized that God was not trying to, uh, that he realized that God was not looking for information. God was trying to set up the groundwork for a miracle. He was actually putting the framework for what was about to take place. God asked the question and Ezekiel answered, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Say with me, Sovereign Lord, Sovereign. you alone know. See, man has always had a quest for knowledge. The source of all knowledge is God, yet we find many times that men are more enamored by the knowledge rather than the giver and the source of the knowledge. Ezekiel knew that the source of all knowledge and information is God. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. See, there are certain things that we're best off not knowing. There are certain information we're best not have. You see, because you've got to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and not into your own understanding, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. See, sometimes when God tells us to do something, we want to be informed, we want to have information. When God says, trust me, you cannot ask for a set of explanations and information and trust Him at the same time. That's conditional. That is conditional. If I understand, if it fits into my frame of mind, then I will trust you. That's not trust. That's us verifying. Come on, man. See, man, you see, sovereign Lord, you alone know. There are certain things that only God knows that we are not to know. We're not supposed to know. I have heard it said that sometimes it is easier to live with the questions than live with the answers. See, some kind of information will mess you up beyond recognition when you could have been, God may be trying to spare us from TMI. Have you ever heard the expression TMI? Sometimes we are a TMI body. Sometimes the body because we want TMI and it's just that TMI we're not prepared to handle it, much less process it and it will end us to sh end up shipwrecking in our faith. Proverbs chapter 25. It is to the glory of God to conceal a matter and to search out the matter is the glory of kings. It was only after the prophet Ezekiel declared his ignorance as to whether the bones could live that God began to instruct him. God will not give us instructions if we think we know what is going on. He will not give us his plan if we already have a plan. See, he will not have his plans compete with our plans. Period. You gotta get rid of more plans so that you can take his plan. When you get rid of your plan and your ideas, you create a vacuum and you invite God. I think I know, but I know, I already know enough to know that I don't have what it takes and I don't have the total pictures and I don't have all the answers, nor do I have all the information, but I'm gonna trust you. You're gonna give me the instructions that I need for this moment in time. Are you with me, church? You see, I believe that it is time to get rid of our preconceived ideas and plans. Many have been trying to fit the coming move of God into the framework of past groups of God. But God is doing a new thing. 
Actually, the Bible tells me in Isaiah chapter 43. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God had to make sure that Ezekiel was in the correct frame of mind and attitude so as to allow God to work in and through him. God is looking for instruments and not counselors. Come on. God is looking for instruments and not counselors. Come on. Who shall counsel the Lord? Can any of us? Uh-uh. No. So God will not share his glory with anyone. A tremendous miracle was about to take place in that valley, but Ezekiel had to realize that he was not the source of the miracle. When Ezekiel declared his inability and his ignorance, then God was able to get things going. The greatest obstacle to the coming revival is not the world, is not political systems, is not even persecution. No, that's not the obstacle. See, the greatest obstacle to the revival is Christians who are wanting wanting to the move of God for self-serving purposes and you want to control it and you want to put their hand to it so as to steal God's glory but that ain't going to happen see they want all the miracles but then they want to control it God is looking for men and women that he can trust who are willing to empty themselves from all mindsets and strategies and ideas and fully and wholeheartedly embrace his will and ways Men and women who have vast amounts of knowledge, but who realize that all of this knowledge is not enough to be able to navigate the move of God. The Bible said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Apostle Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships, in persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then... I am strong. Uh, this is the thing that with the Apostle Paul, he was a scholar of his time. He studied at the feet of Gamal, yeah, one of the greatest scholars of that time. He was well versed in scripture, but all of this knowledge of the word without relationship with the author of the word led him to murder and to persecute the body of Christ. Yes, See, the letter of the law kills. The letter of the law kills. And the, the, you see, there, there are believers that they're full, they get full and full of the word and they can never get enough information and they have itching ears. The Bible talks about such a thing. With Come itching on. ears, learning and learning and learning, never stop learning but never applying. What good is it, knowledge if you're not applying it? And please, hear my heart when I tell you this. I'd rather you knew less of the word and whatever little you knew that you would put it into practice. Because you're going to be held responsible for what you know. Are you with me? Amen. Have you ever been beat upside the head with the word? Come on. Ah, it don't feel very nice. But the problem is those who go around looking, trying to fault find and beat others with the Come word. On. You look at their lives and they're not obeying the word. So it only applies one way and not the other way. But the Bible tells me that the word of God is a two-edged sword. It cuts this way and it cuts that way. So when I take the sword of the Lord, I'm getting cut here, y'all. Are you with me? The Damascus world encounter with Christ cut soul of Tarsus down to size. He was blind for a while and came to the realization that he knew a lot about God, but that he did not know him. God loved Saul of Tarsus and wanted to direct him, yet Saul had to realize that his seniority in the religious world was not an asset, but rather a liability. Yeah. In this hour, God is looking for men and women who are willing to put aside any sense of entitlement and seniority. God is looking for men and women who are willing to become nothing so that Christ can become their all. Yeah. The move of God is coming at a high rate of speed. There is an urgency in the atmosphere. Get ready, get ready, get yeah. ready. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, has heard what the Lord has in store for those who love him. But going back to the valley of the dry bones, Ezekiel had already declared that God alone knew if the bones, if the bones could live. The stage was set. God began to instruct the prophet about what he was to say. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 4. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. It is important to know that in order for the prophet to speak the word of the Lord, he had to get rid of his own word, Come on. his own opinion. The prophet became a usable birth vessel that would, that would obey the word of the Lord. It was not Ezekiel's word. It was God's word, but it was Ezekiel's voice, but it was the word of the most high God. Prophesy to these bones and say to them. It's interesting to know that God instructed Ezekiel to speak to dry bones. 
The bones are part of the skeleton. This is yeah, the very wow. basic scaffold or framework for the human body. As we have reviewed before, there are 206 bones in our, human, in our bodies. The bones act as a supporting structure for the rest of the body. Its functions involve supporting the body, facilitating movement, protecting internal organs, producing blood cells, and also be acts as a store and releasing of minerals and fat. Bones are the last part of the body to decay. They are made up of minerals like calcium, magnesium, among others. In the right environment, bones can last many years, even centuries. Paleontology is a study of ancient life. This is based on examining the remains of animals that lived in the past. For example, we know about dinosaurs, that, and, and we can actually reconstruct what they look like based on the skeletal remains. In the study of ancient, ancient culture, scientists can find clues to what life and nutrition was like in those times by studying the bones found in graves. Bones tell a story even after all of the soft tissues have decayed. Forensic scientists can reconstruct and ascertain the cause of death of an individual by examining the bones. Yeah. In this forensic analysis, by analyzing the bones composition, they can tell there were poisonous substances that may have led to the demise of the person involved. Bones tell a story to those who are willing to observe and to study and to listen. Bones can actually speak if we're willing to listen. And if bones can speak, bones can also hear. Come on. Many a criminal case have been brought to conclusion by the study of the bones. Scientists can tell that even the sex of a deceased, deceased person based on the skeletal remains, especially of the pelvis and of the jawbone. There are sex differences. The age of the person can also be ascertained by the structure of the bones and even the joints. As someone ages, the bones change accordingly. In early people, there are signs of arthritis that give a clue as to the age of the individual. Now I want to, I want to invite you again to consider the bones. Most of them, most think as the, of them as the last thing that remains, but in fact the bones are the scaffolding the bony structure is what allows the rest of the organs, muscles, and nerves to have their place. They, have, they are actually protected by them. It is important to note that the most vital organs are encased in bones. For example, our brains, as delicate as they are, are encased in a skull. And some have harder skulls than others, but I'm not going to go into that this morning. The spinal cord is the tunnel through which all of the delicate nerves of the spinal cord originate from the brain and come down to supply every part of the body. The heart and the lungs, on the other hand, are protected by what scientists call the thoracic cage, which is made up of the ribs and the thoracic spine. As we take a closer look at it, I'm reminded of the scripture that says in Psalms 139, 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. It's not just the bones in and of themselves. The position of the bones relative to each other allows for locomotion. It is important for in movement. Consider the hand, which is one of the most complex structures in the human body. There are 27 bones that make up the hand and wrist. These allow for fine movement and our ability to grasp objects and to do major feats of strength and extremely delicate things. Consider a pianist. Imagine if all the muscles in the hand were located in the hand, our hands would be huge and our fingers, but they're located in the forearm and there are strings that go down that yeah. control the bones. And so a pianist, a concert pianist can make beautiful music. Consider the feet. The bones of the feet actually support and help the balance to balance the weight of the entire body. When was the last time you thanked your feet for putting up with all the weight and punishment you have given them? The bones are marvels of creation. They are solid, strong, and yet they are light and hollow on the inside. The bone marrow is the factory where blood cells are manufactured that send oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the body. I want us to think about the bones again for the first time ever. Bones in the Bible are very significant. I, we read, if we read the account about God creating Adam and Eve, and let us go back to the book of Genesis chapter 2. So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's rib and then closed up that place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. 
It is interesting to me that God created Eve by resetting a rib out of Adam. This was, of course, after he had put Adam to sleep. This is the first documented case of general anesthesia and the first ever recorded rib resection, thorough economy with rib resection. God started the creation of Eve with a bone. From that bone, he created the scaffolding that supported the entire body and organs of Eve. What a marvelous God we serve. In the Old Testament, we found we found how bones were referred to as the source of close relationship. Genesis 2.23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But going back to the valley of desolation, God asked Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. This in the natural did not make much sense. How can this bone, how can the bones hear the word of the Lord? Do bones have ears? No. But we do know that bones have the ability to carry and to transmit sound. God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. The only way Ezekiel could have prophesied to the dry bones was because he had totally surrendered to him. He has totally put his opinions aside and trusted God and did exactly what he told him to say. He had to be willing to do something he had never done before. The only way to experience what you have never experienced before is to do what you have never done before. Ezekiel was prepared to do it God's way. Are you ready to do it God's way? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Maybe it's a good decision to put aside the way you've been doing it and ask God for the master plan. No wonder the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. I've heard people who want to move of God but are not willing to let God have the reins. Ezekiel spoke to the dry bones. It was just him and God. No fans, no audience to cheer him on. I wonder what Ezekiel felt like when he was speaking. But he was determined to obey in a radical way. Do you realize that the fire of God can be transmitted in your bones? If you doubt that, then ask the prophet Jeremiah. And I read to you of Jeremiah chapter 20. I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary, I'm, a, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. The fire of God, the presence of God can be felt in your bones. The one who, who thought of and created our scaffolding is certainly able to move in it. Do you realize that the power of God can even be stored up in bones? Did you realize that? Let me prove it to you through scripture. If we turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 13. Is Elisha died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a man of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bone, the man came for, to life and stood up on his feet. The scenario was after the death of the prophet Elisha in the spring, some Israelites were burying a man. When suddenly a band of Moabite raiders appeared, the men who were burying the dead threw the body into the Elisha's tomb. And when the body of this man touched Elisha's bone, he immediately resurrected. The power of God can be felt and is transmissible. Even the bones can store up enough residue of the glory of God to cause a resurrection. Now it is important to note that the men burying the dead man were digging the tomb for this man. When they accidentally threw the body of this man into Elisha's tomb, which caused a miracle of resurrection. See, this was a testimony to the people of Israel that the God of Elijah and Elisha was still in the miracle yeah. working business. That even in the middle of an enemy attack, that the power of God could still come into display. See, you may be under attack, but that does not cancel God's power. Hallelujah. We should walk through the fire. It will not burn us. We should walk through the rivers. They will not overtake us. He said he will be with us always through any and every situation. This was it. See, we need to get so full of God that our bodies become saturated with the presence of God. If you live long enough in the presence of of God, your body will get saturated by it. People of God, let, let us not become weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not faint. Hallelujah. Now I want to interject this morning. There are individuals who actually go to tombs of great men and women of God and do what is described, the so-called grave-sucking. 
I'm just saying. So listen, we worship a living God, a God who is alive. There is a reason why the tomb of Christ is empty. If there were any artifacts left, they would have become the object of idolatry. We worship God and God alone. We don't worship the bones of the graves because see, Jesus is no longer in the grave. And when a man and woman of God is buried, they're no longer there. They're with Jesus. So why in the world are we looking among the dead? Him who is alive, him who is seated on the throne. No wonder the Bible says, and I quote you out of Exodus chapter 20, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Did you realize that there are cultures that worship ancestors? They actually take the bones of their deceased ones and they worship them and they build altars to them. But what they don't realize is that these are ancestral spirits. There are practices connected to witchcraft and are demonic. Do not be seduced. Do not be enticed. I don't care how many out of context scriptures are quoted. Do not engage in any such activity. If you notice, I'm being very pastoral. But let us return back to the valley of desolation with Ezekiel and God. And he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. In the time of the prophet Ezekiel, there was a valley full of bones. These bones were dry. This is the forensic evidence that the vast group of, of people, individuals, had suddenly and catastrophically met their demise. The prophet was to repeat what God was telling him to say, nothing more and nothing less. This is the thing. We cannot hear God say one thing and then us try to adorn it or to make it more or improve on it. See, people of God, people who do such things are in fact trying to save their own reputations. Come on. See, in order to speak what God is saying, you must be of no reputation. You must be of no reputation. On the other hand, they are the what I call the mad prophets today, who are mad at the world. They are disappointed at others and wonder why their gift is not recognized. I have seen this uh, type of individuals. I've been growing up in church. Every prophetic word that uh, this kind of what I call mad prophet was doom and gloom. He was spoken with an attitude that inflicts fear and intimidation, and they were out like if you dare even look the other way, you were immediately. Oh my God, yeah. it was like the fear of the Lord, like, oh Jesus, don't burn me up. I've <laughs> been there as a child, I said, oh my God, I'm going like, that's, I'm not sure that's the kind of God I want to, because it is, it's really just like a reign of terror. Yeah. Come on, Mr. Ron, you know what I'm talking about, you've been around those two, <laughs> amen? Well, many of these people had a true prophetic gift in their lives. Their filters were polluted by their yeah. flesh. Yeah. Exactly. This is why when we prophesy, we need to make sure that we are to transmit and reflect the heart of the one whose words we are declaring. Yes. Are you with me, church? The Bible tells me that God is love. Now, let me quote to you the word, right? What does the word say about God, about his nature, about his character? Psalms 103, praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Let me read that again. The Lord is compassionate and what? And gracious. gracious. Slow to anger and what? And abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. See, Someone who's always angry at the world, angry with the body of Christ, is not truly reflecting the character of God. Come on. 
I'm just saved. And this is not even said to condemn, but to cause any such individual that sound on my voice to wake up and go back to the heart of God and ask and repent and ask not just to have the word of the Lord, but to have the heart of God in their lives. Yeah, come on. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, find a reason to get mad about that. I think that this psalm captures the essence of the nature of God towards us. He's a good God who wants good things for his children. For I know the thirst, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans, plans of good to bring you an expected end. Plans of good and not of destruction. God is not angry. God is not an angry old man seated on the throne waiting to pounce judgment on his creation. The Lord is full of mercy and compassion for us. In my experience in the prophetic realm, there are times that God would reveal to me the awful state of someone's heart and actions. I personally have trouble handling it. I go like, ew. But you know, what's even more marvelous to me is that, but God does not expect me to speak from my own fleshly realm, attitude, or reaction, what I have found out is that God will usually turn around and bring the necessary correction in a spirit and attitude of love and reconciliation. Yeah, Are you with me, church? Moses, see, and, and normally God does not expose or humiliate people in public. That's not generally the nature of God. He does not, he will humble us, but he will never humiliate us. What is the difference? When you get humiliated, you get your dignity taken away. God will never be a part of or an author of such thing. Are you with me, church? Because I want to instruct you and to understand. Because many will come in the name of the Lord. And they will sound authoritative. And they will be angry. My God, they will be angry because they want control. And they want to manipulate. And they want to keep up with whatever word they gave you. Look, if I give a word, it's his word, not mine. So I see it and I forget it. Because it is God's it's his responsibility with that person to bring it to pass. Not mine. I'm just a messenger. Hello. How can this microphone be held responsible for what I speak into it? There you go. Nonsense, isn't it? <laughs> Moses was the most humble man. He was instructed by, instructed by God to speak to the rock. Let me read to you out of Numbers chapter 20. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. So, like any normal good leader, God appointed leader, there will be opposition. So Moses <laughs> gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. Welcome to leadership, by the way. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the, the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock. Say with me. Repeat after me. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock, Speak to the rock before their eyes, and he will pour out his water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. But... He and Aaron gathered the, the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? The mistake is he took it personal. He took it a little bit too personal. 
And yes, the attacks are personal, but it is not against you. It's against the one who sent you. And you have to be able to disengage. Yes, the attacks are personal. And they, look, some of the worst bites are not wolves bites, they're sheep bites. Yeah. I guarantee you, they hurt. Yeah. Let me tell you, but it's not, it's not your word, it's his word. Are you with me? I want to remind you, do not take it personally. Disengage, disconnect, disengage, disconnect. Leave room for God's wrath. God will not be mocked and man will reap whatsoever he sows. Do not touch God anointed. Do not do his prophets any harm. The Bible says, I'm just saying what the Bible says, y'all. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community and their lives have drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community to the land I will give them. Isn't that interesting? See, Moses, the most humble man. Can you imagine the level of irritation and personal attacks this man had to go through? He was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. But the Lord asked him to trust. And God said, I, the same staff that turned into a serpent in front of, of, of the Pharaoh, the same staff that he raised in front of the Red Sea that opened the sea, God says, I want you to take the staff in front of the people. But instead of using the staff, speak to the rock. Yeah. See, you, the staff represents the authority. But there are times that you can use the authority in a punitive way, or you can simply speak yeah. what God said to speak. There is a difference, you know? Praise God. This is the classic mistake that anyone can make. It is important to say exactly what God is saying with the same attitude and spirit that He wants us to say. But going back again to the Valley of the Dry Bones, Ezekiel chapter 37, then He said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. The fact of the matter is that God has called us to a valley of dry bones. All the bones are of the religious. The bones are of those who once walked with God, but the cares of this world drown their faith. The bones are of the generation that has borrowed their offices of their parents against the things of God and against the church. Yes, the panorama appears hopeless. I want the worship team to come up, please. The bones are those situations that we we think are beyond repair in a society where there is a move to erase history and the past. There are the remnants of past move of God that happened before, but now there appears to be a valley of desolation and despair. There are some people who are stuck in those valleys yeah. waiting, waiting for a move of God that has already come and gone, but they have died and they have their bones have dried up because they are in the valley of desolation. In the valley, God, I expect you to move the exact same way you moved back in the 1950s. Come on, come on. God, I expect you to move like in the 70s with the Jesus people. The people who are still camping in the valley That's it. of come the on. word of faith movement. Come on. Listen, all those moves of God were amazing. Yeah. Oh, but we gotta keep moving on with God. That's right. We gotta keep walking. We gotta keep moving, putting one foot in front of the other. Come on. And those past moves of God have taught us valuable lessons. Yeah. Come on. But we're not there any longer. That's right. The on. heroes of those movements have most of them have gone on to be with the Lord. And we honor their contribution, their faithfulness. Because they did amazing things yeah. in their generation. The community of Forest Hill is one of those many valleys of desolation, full of bones of past promising individuals who have turned to isolation and substance abuse. Yeah, they have beautiful homes and enormous bank accounts, but in fact, the fact is that they are spiritually and emotionally dead. They're dried up and dried out, and I'm not saying this in a condemning way. It's really, honestly, a tragedy. How could you have known about the living God? And then isolated yourself. Come on. Because somebody done me wrong, son. Yeah, come on. 
we have to step back because we have allowed the, the wounding, even the well-meaning people, to create such a chasm between us and God. See, God wasn't the one that offended you. It was because you had put your hope in a person instead of the living God. And if you look at man long enough, you will find a fault. I promise you. I guarantee you. But my Bible tells me that we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. There appears to be no hope. The bones are very, very dry. The bone are, bones are many and the valley is full of them. God has called us to walk among the bones. See, we have gone back and forth against some, uh, amongst a lot of bones. We have done so and continue to do so when we have community outreaches and evangelistic crusades. But God and only God knows that these bones will live because there is an appointed time. The bones didn't get dry overnight. It was a long time. But God is choosing the Ezekiels of this generation. And I'm reminded of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was supposed to be a priest in Jerusalem. His father's name was a high priest named Buzia. And he had it all set up. And he was in line to be the next high priest. One of the priests. What an incredible thing. But all of a sudden, Babylonian captivity came. Yeah. And he found himself in a country that was not his own, under indentured servitude. And the Bible describes how they were, they were crying by the river Kibar. And they had hung up their harps by the river. Because their captivity snuffed out their hopes and their dreams. But in the middle of that, Ezekiel was not supposed to be a priest. Ezekiel found his calling in captivity. A calling that would transcend natural, national boundaries. Yeah. A calling that was supposed to be for all men and women across, not just the world, but the times and era, yeah. including us. Yes, come on. The story of the Ezekiel. God is raising up Ezekiels in this hour. Hallelujah. There's a great move of God on the horizon. The Ezekiels of this generation, this, yes, those who are not where they think they should be, those who landed in their geographic locations not by their own choice. It was not fate or circumstances that got you here. God destined you to be here. How many would willingly pay a fare to go to a valley of bones? No one said no one ever. He brought you to this valley of desolation with a purpose. The purpose is amazing. The purpose is good. God is about to give specific instructions. We're only to speak what he says, nothing more and nothing less. There's a miracle of resurrection of generations that will go from a state of spiritual death to life. You are the Ezekiel to your personal valley. You are the Ezekiels to this valley, corporate valley. We're going to speak the word of the Lord and just at the prophet Ezekiel, we will say, let's stand up to our feet. Repeat after me. Dry bones. Dry bones. Hear, the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. I want you to close your eyes right now. And I know many here have situation, family situations. Oh my God. Are there dry bones in my family, in my generation? God, am I the only one left? But you know what? He raised you up to bring life and to speak His word and not your opinion. Some of you all need to begin to pray for lost family members that you, because you knew them so well, you've given up because you really know all the details. So you've already given hope. 
Believe me, I know what it's like. It's happened to me. Say it with me. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. One last time. Dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. But the first valley may be within yourself. You know what the dry bones may represent? I see little boys and little girls who were who were trespassed physically at a young age. And there's a valley of dry bones that you have not even dared to tell anyone. But God has taken you there not to put you into a state of despair, but to speak life and resurrection. Because you're not supposed to go alone. God wants to use you to raise an army from the place of hopelessness and despair. What are the dry bones? People who have persecuted you, misused you, and abused you. How do you speak to that those dry bones? Well, you, you, you give forgiveness, even when they don't deserve it. The Bible tells me if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. You know what? I choose to release and forgive those who have wounded me and spoke ill against me today in the name of Jesus. Lord, you be the judge. But I want my heart to be in the right place, Jesus. I want my heart to be in the right place. Say it with me, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. See, it's your voice, but it's his word. It's your voice, but it is his word. Raise your hands. God has commissioned the Ezekiel's of this hour to be empowered just like the Ezekiel of his time in the worst place of captivity he could ever be. With broken dreams and what he thought was a broken future, but God had a greater calling for him. God chose the place of captivity to raise a prophet to nations. A prophet to the nations. A prophet to the nations. Receive, receive the glory of God. God wants to saturate your life even to the bones. Your bones, your bones shall carry the glory of God. You're going to be saturated. See, God always goes back to the scaffolding. It's like, this is what's happened. This is what I see God doing in this body. He's ripping off all the sheetrock and exposing the studs, taking off the roof and the chandels. Taking down all the cabinets and doing the correct repair in that internal leak that was causing a rot in the structure, your structure of your life. He's pinpointing it and resolving it. Leanne, because the Lord says you belong to Him, He has raised you to Himself, and you're a prophet to your family and to your generations. I declare that whatever the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around for your good. I bless you in the name of the Lord. His will is to heal us. But we have to give him permission. He wants to take you down to the studs, to the structure, because that's how he works. Go down to the place. He works from the inside to the outside. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. I speak healing right now. Healing to your emotions. Healing to your life. Healing to your memories. God will not give you amnesia. You will remember, but it will not hurt you. You will remember because see, amnesia is pathologic. Yeah. But when you forget, 
is that you are able to remember if you want to, but it no longer is attached to the pain and the desire for revenge. I want you to keep your arms raised up. Receive the healing. Receive your healing. It may have been a parent, an abusive parent, a relative. I don't know. It may have been somebody in the church. Lord knows. Somebody done you wrong. Isn't that the story of all of our lives? So when are we going to bury the hatchet? When does the, the, this curse stops? It stops today. It stops with you. Say with me again, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones. So what is revival? What is the move of God? What is it? What is the move of God? It's when the dry bones of our lives stand to attention. That's the way it all begins. It begins with me. It begins with you. It begins with each and every one of us. It begins with this church body. Then and only then, God didn't send a corpse into the valley of the dry bones. He sent the live prophet. Prophets come alive again. Prophets come alive again. In the name of Jesus. There are valleys assigned that we will speak life to. I bless you in the name of the Lord. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you peace. May the Lord strengthen you. I bless you in the name of the Lord. And by the way, Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. We celebrate the birth of our Savior. I love you all.